Thank you for, for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here, talk to you. Um, so um, if, in case you don't know me, my name is Kyle Chapman. I'm actually a graduate student here at MIT, but um, also the newest member to Cosmo Ventures, which is a venture capital firm here in Boston, headquartered here in Boston, that specializes in investing in blockchain technology companies, specifically those that have um, the option to ICO, hopefully in the near, near future. Um, with me on the panel, thrilled to have um, Ed McNearney. Ed is a member of actually one of Cosmo's portfolio companies. Uh, he has served as a CTO to a number of companies, from startups to Fortune 100 firms, and most recently was responsible for design and engineering of new competitions at XPRIZE Foundation, which is exciting. So we're glad to have Ed here today. Also with me is Navroop Sedev, uh, an economist and uh, someone who's building her own blockchain-focused fintech company. She's a research associate at the Center for Blockchain Technologies at University of College London, holds three master's degrees, and is the author of many blockchain-oriented publications and serves on the advisory board of several blockchain companies. So we're excited to have someone so well-versed in the blockchain ecosystem as well. Finally, last but not least, we have John. Uh, John Hargrave is the publisher of Bitcoin Market Journal, which attracts thousands of Bit investors to Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and ICOs. He's also the CEO of Media Shower, a leading media company connecting blockchains with great investors. So we're thrilled to, to have everyone here today. And we thought that it would be um, a good idea for each of us to speak briefly on different topics that we find most interesting when it comes to blockchain and ICOs. And then uh, after each of us speak for a little bit, we're going to open it up for a more fluid discussion amongst the four of us. Um, and then at the end, if we have time, we'll open it up for, for questions. So my background before I came to MIT, I was working predominantly in the traditional ac equity capital market space. Um, so I was doing a lot of work with marketing IPOs as well as fundraising for, for alternative investments such as you know, head fund, hedge funds and, and private equity firms, right? So when you hear about the comparison of ICOs versus IPOs, um, the conversation really falls flat when you don't understand why the current IPO model isn't really working. And it also falls short when you realize that ICOs aren't just a direct competitor of, of initial public offerings, but also an alternative way for funding mechanisms to, to raise capital. So not only are they competitive for, for companies to raise capital publicly, but they're also competitive for investment vehicles to raise funds publicly. So just briefly, I'm going to start with the, the IPO market and why it's, for lack of a better word, broken today. Um, so typically, when a company wants to go public or raise funds publicly, um, they'll have to hit a certain threshold of valuation, typically looking to raise $100, $150 million publicly, which is just the threshold for a large Wall Street bank to, to actually turn a profit, which makes sense. These are, these are large, um, large banks, and they, they require large customers, right? Um, but So that creates a barrier of entry for smaller startups to actually be able to raise that capital publicly. But even if a company can get to that threshold of valuation, what will typically happen is a syndicate of investment banks will go to that company and say, okay, we're going to make a firm commitment to buy your shares at X, and then they're going to turn around and sell it to their investors, their clients, at X plus one, make a $1 spread or whatever the markup is um, on each share. So that's how an investment bank makes money in an IPO. But the problem with that is that the clients of those banks are not you and I, okay? They're very large institutional buyers. And the reason for that is that IPOs aren't the only things that come across the desk of an investment bank, as I'm sure a lot of you know. There's follow-on offerings, there's block trades, which comprise 90% of the offerings that, that investment banks hold. So what they do is they build a book of very large institutional buyers who have the ability to participate in every deal that comes across a bank. So whether that's a follow-on offering, a block trade, or an IPO, there's an understanding that they're going to participate in every deal to provide liquidity to, to the company, right? Um, but the problem with that is that you, you, what you've created is, is really just an economic purchaser's oligopoly, where only large institutional investors have access to the premium that's available between the primary issu issuance of a, of a stock and the, its publicly traded stock price, its open price. 
right? And what an ICO does is it, it enables smaller companies, companies of any size really, to actually be able to market their coins themselves, so completely circumnavigating the need for a bank, and they're able to sort of market their investment opportunity to a, a wider breadth of accredited investors. So it's good for your average retail investor who doesn't need a relationship with a large bank, and it's good for companies that can diversify their capital, okay? And John is gonna talk a little bit more about ICOs. But um, more simply, on the tokenization model, you have um, private equity funds that typically look to raise capital either by going to large asset management firms requiring a minimum of 50, $100 million at, at one go. And if you can't write that check, they'll go to a private bank with ultra high net worth individuals um, to create a fund of funds and raise, raise money that way. But again, you have the simple fact that your average retail investor doesn't have access to these type of elite funds that the 1% or 0.01% actually have. Okay, so it's the same sort of oligopoly problem. But again, with a tokenized fund that you can raise through an, through an ICO, uh, a fund is actually available to market their, uh, their, their capabilities directly to any accredited investor. There's a limited amount that you can market to directly in the US, but they can diversify their, their capital uh, either domestically and internationally. So there's a few benefits of ICOs, and you can see that it's already actually happening um, upstream in the venture capital market. ICO fundraising has completely dwarfed uh, fundraising from venture capital firms this year alone. I mean, it's, uh, the, the size of it is just, just incredible. And that makes sense because obviously with a new technology, you're gonna have people closest to that technology utilizing it first. And here I've included a graph that um, really marks the adoption of different technologies throughout the last 100 years in the US of the addressable market. So this has the radio on it, it has color television, the light bulb, and there's two things that you'll, you'll notice with the adoption of two technologies. One is they both follow more or less a type of an S-curve of adoption, um, and that it really hits an inflection point at around 10% of the addressable market. So once 10% of the addressable market starts utilizing a new technology, whether that's a light bulb, a radio, or an ICO fundraising mechanism, that's really the inflection point that the curve really steepens at. You'll also notice that as time goes on, these S-curves get a lot steeper, right? So the iPad was a lot quicker to catch on than electricity was, it just makes, it makes sense. So when it comes to ICOs, a lot of people are wondering, okay, well, when is it gonna completely displace IPOs, if it ever will? When is, it gonna be a, when is every fund gonna be a tokenized fundraising mechanism? And that's really dependent and contingent upon regulatory environments to be able to give some structure, some legal structure to that environment. And at that point, it just becomes a question of when it's gonna hit that 10% of addressable market adoption. And when that happens, I think we're gonna see a very large upstream movement of ICOs. So not just being utilized by startups, but by bigger companies. I mean, we saw Telegram's ICO the other day, which was massive. It's a record-breaking ICO. So it's just a matter of time before it hits that inflection point and actually sort of moves upstream to larger um, vehicles and can directly compete with IPOs. So I know it's a little long-winded for an intro here, but uh, at Cosmo, we, we feel strongly about this, especially as a venture capital firm that focuses on blockchain. And we believe, quite simply, that a business that hopes to be the leader and developer of other businesses cannot stand idle in the adoption of the very technologies that it hopes to advance through its portfolio companies. So we feel strongly that ICOs will, will be, I mean, with, with regulatory guidance, um, a very viable fundraising mechanism in the future, as well as tokenized funds. We believe they're gonna become more commonplace. So thanks for that. Um, I'm uh, gonna now turn it over to Ed, who's gonna talk a little bit more about, about ICOs. Great, thanks. There it is. Um, <laughs> great. So I'm the CTO at Onero, and we're a, a new startup, and I've been part of the team for two weeks and two days now. Yeah. Um, it's pretty <laughs> exciting. It's a 
it's pretty cool. And I think, you know, obviously that's, that's one thing you find in the blockchain space, but I actually think it's pretty cool, right? Nobody's been doing this for 20 years, right? And so you get a lot of people coming to this space as a tool where they've got ideas. They understand a problem. They have a problem they need to solve, which is always great. I, you know, I, I really dislike startups who start by saying, hey, we can make a lot of money doing this, instead of saying, here's a really valuable problem. Here's a, you know, th we've got people out there that we can, we can really help with. Um, I want to ask a couple questions just, just first. How many of you have been involved with a VC-funded startup in, in any way? Got a couple? Okay, great. Um, how many of you have been or are involved with uh, a, a company that plans to raise money through an ICO? Got a couple of those, okay. Um, how many have actually raised money through an ICO? Okay, one in the back there, great. That was, that was the, this is the session after lunch, I get people to move around a little bit so you don't <laughs> fall asleep uh, exercise. But, but that, that's helpful. Um, and I've been through a, a couple of VC experiences and I wanted to just sort of uh, spend, you know, a few minutes sort of following up on, on Kyle's intro and comparing to the extent we know them, the, the real differences between these models, right? And everybody, uh, everybody in the entrepreneur world likes to dump on the VCs, right? They're a pain in the ass, they are all, they're all over you, they get a guy in your board, they, they, they take huge chunks of equity from you, you know, ugh, good, right? Um, and they're on your side, right? They're, they're your best friend, right? Because they've been here before, they understand it, um, their interests are very clear, right? They're there. It's always easier to uh, do business with somebody if you know what their motivation is, right? And it's really easy to figure out what the VC's motivation is. There's, there's no question about that. And they know that they need to keep supporting you and keep moving on. And so there's really, you know, it's, you might say, a, a, a somewhat stodgy, uh, staid model um, although, you know, I've certainly seen it evolve over the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, but it's got some pretty clear uh, advantages, disadvantages. And I think you really, you know, we should all really uh, keep an eye on those, kind of not, not lose sight of those. Uh, in the ICO world, um, you know, ICO is sort of like infinite choice of options, right? I mean, there's just like so many different, like there's just no playbook, right? You could do whatever you want to do. And uh, I think it, I find it most, uh, most valuable, you know, uh, when uh, Tezos did their ICO uh, and afterwards, and they had a rather bumpy road, right? But uh, they, uh, uh, Captain Breitman uh, said that, that, you know, their coin purchasers, you know, should have expected that uh, what they were really doing was like, donating money to a nonprofit and getting a tote bag in exchange, right? Now, uh, I think Tim Drake, Draper said, I wasn't expecting any tote bag, right? I was <laughs> expecting a little more than that. Um, and uh, the best analogy that I've come up with uh, with an ICO model is think of it more like Kickstarter, but your tote bags, there's a market for your tote bags, right? So there's, there, there's a way that you can, can, can move those, that, that value around from the purchaser side doesn't change your business model. Um, it doesn't change the fact, I should say business model, it doesn't change your business plan. You need to do all the same stuff that you always needed to do, right? There's no uh, magic dust here that's going to uh, take your uh, unresearched, uh, disorganized, you know, chaotic idea and, uh, and turn it into, into something magical, right? And, uh, you know, you have an opportunity here that I think is worth uh, looking at after you've thought about the VC approach. Don't have to think about it very long, just don't discard it out of hand, right? And I think one of the reasons there is if you're not successful in the VC world, then no harm done, you can move into an ICO world, there, there's, there's no problem there, right? If you've done an ICO and had whatever level of success and then w are looking for VC, you may have a bumpier road, right? You now have some kind of obligations out there. You've got some kind of something. 
It makes things complicated. VCs tend to like things they understand and, and, and you know, be a more structured model. So you might want to think about that uh, you know, along the way. But you, you really need to think about what's the real, again, not from your end, from the, the user's end, what, what obligations are you exchanging with that coin to token purchaser, right? And what's, what are their <coughs> uh, expectations? Uh, you know, I think it's, uh, everybody likes to, to joke and, and chuckle about crypto kitties, right? And I know John's a fan of crypto <coughs> kitties. And, and for good reason, right? Because people know what the hell they're getting, right? They know exactly what it is they're getting. They, they understand the, the market for what they got and how they can, can exchange it. They don't particularly, you know, I don't think they're particularly looking for a lot of liquidity in the sense of exchange back and forth into dollars. They're really, you know, these are, you know, Tamagotchi on the blockchain, right? I mean, this is, you know, this is, this is there's nothing wrong with that business, right? Um, and so, you know, I think that's a really, uh, you know, it's a really simple point. It's old news. Um, you know, it's, but, you know, the rules don't change. And I think that that last bit about uh, liquidity, in, and, and, and in this context, I'm going to say liquidity is, uh, is exchanging the interface between uh, fiat currency, dollars, whatever, and, and your tokens, right? And, uh, you know, obviously, if you're, if you're going that route, think about what's happening. Look at the exchanges. There are some exchanges that are really easy. They'll sort of pretty much take anybody. Um, on the other hand, uh, look at the exchanges. Look at the data. Um, I did a quick look uh, this morning uh, on uh, Cryptopia, which uh, has 992 trading pairs right now, um, well, one of the biggest I know. And about 80 of them were doing more than $10,000 a day. right? Um, so 912 of them are, you know, there are a lot of zeros down there. So that, that's not necessarily, you know, you may not be looking for, for something that big, but just think about what your users are expecting and what their, what their expectations are. Again, if you're more in the utility token space, maybe that's not a big deal. You're, you're, people are expecting to pay dollars to, to be able to do something uh, on your network, right? But, you know, just think about that piece. and and. I would say that my last point uh, related to that is if you're thinking about that piece, everybody's thinking about regulators and, and the SEC and the CFTC, and that's a really good thing to think about. Don't build your business plan around current regulation, right? Build a big, good business plan, and then talk to your lawyers and figure out how that can fit into a regulatory framework, right? Because it is probably gonna change next week, next month, whatever. It'll continue to change, it'll continue to evolve, and you don't want to be that to be the, the <coughs> tail uh, wagging your dog. Uh, and just sort of last example I want to give in terms of value, you know, what is it you're, you're building for your token holders? I would say uh, on Tuesday, we may get a really interesting lesson. Uh, Verge recently uh, sold 70 million uh, of their tokens, um, and the funds were to acquire a mystery partner. I mean, I don't know what the hell kind of business plan that is or why I would <laughs> buy one of these things. Like, give us your money and we're going to buy something with it, right? But on Tuesday, they're supposed to be announcing uh, what it is. So maybe I will uh, be proven to be uh, an unwarranted cynic, but uh, I, I encourage you all to have a better answer than that about what your, <laughs> what your coins are gonna do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, um, so this panel is all about raising capital. So I wanna have a quick show of hands here. How many of you have been involved in raising capital in the past in some capacity? Okay, so around 20, 25% of the people. Um, now the reason why we thought this panel was so interesting is because of this new model of ICOs, right? That is seeking to disrupt the traditional models which are first of all doing an IPO, going public, raising uh, private equity or from VCs, both perspectives that you heard so far. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about a new way of raising capital that the Jobs Act enabled, and that is crowdfunding. And how, in fact, ICOs 
is uh, a successor of the crowdfunding uh, model. Um, a little about myself, I'm a fellow at MIT Connection Science, which is at the Media Lab, uh, and uh, Kyle already introduced me, also a fellow at UCL London. Um, but more importantly, I was uh, involved in the early days of crowdfunding. So May 2016 is when the SEC allowed and put forward the rules for uh, Reg CF, which is regulation crowdfunding. Uh, again, uh, crowdfunding is of three types at least. The first one, Kickstarter, that uh, I talked about is a rewards-based funding model. The second one is uh, it's simply a donation-based funding model, right? So examples would be something like GoFundMe, where people who are putting money into these campaigns are not expecting anything. But that is drastically different from the equity crowdfunding model, uh, where the people who are investing are expecting returns. So then, uh, this is regulated by the securities uh, laws of the country. Um, so anyway, that was allowed from uh, 2016 in the US. Also, I was involved in um, authoring Hyperledger's uh, online course, Blockchain for Business. I'll talk a little bit more about it. But just to tie it all in before John presents the, you know, the groundbreaking work we've done together, um, I want to talk about the need for alternative uh, ways of raising capital, right? So Carl gave an excellent uh, example, or I would say an evolution of why ICOs do promise to be uh, disruptive. But I mean, look at this. Here's the here's the data, right? Uh, the number of IPOs that are happening ever since 20, 1995, let me just, uh, or 2000, is actually on the decline. So the small, the micro, and the medium cap companies are uh, declining, but not as much. But the biggest difference is the, the, the companies with the, the highest cap, the mega cap companies. And the reason for that is, first of all, regulation. The cost of going public is increasing, uh, particularly after the Dodd-Frank Act, and exponentially so. so Little, I want to say, companies and entrepreneurs who are looking to raise capital. This is not, a, 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 you know, a way out. So even if you raised money from VCs, you're not a hundred million dollar company or a billion dollar market cap company and are able to go public. And the second thing I want to talk about is the fact that finance, from the way we understand it, is changing. And in fact, the reasons that are at the forefront are related to demographics. So millennials, people who are something between 20 to 35 years of age today are at the forefront of it. They are not playing golf, they're not buying houses, they're holding a lot of cash, they're not investing in public markets, uh, so on and so forth. So there's actually supply of capital that is not being fully utilized. People do not want to look at screens for hours from NASDAQ and NYSE and try to invest in the public markets. It's harder and harder to interface with public markets because uh, the market is so fragmented, because there's so many people along the way you have to deal with. Unless you go through a trader broker, you cannot directly buy any stock or security in the public market. right? So these are the trends that sit at the forefront of it and millennials as the agent of change. So think, for example, 50% believe that a few years in time, we will not be talking to banks at all. And hence, uh, finance is ripe for disruption from companies like PayPal, like Venmo, like uh, more, I would, I want to say, more distributed and decentralized companies. Uh, so moving on, this is what people are looking for, right? They're looking for simplification, transparency, and be able to understand it without an information overload. Information data is increasing, not at a linear scale, but an exponential scale. So that means it's, it's, it's harder and harder to, to digest it, right? So simplification is needed and reduced frictions. Uh, there's also an element of loss of trust and faith, I want to say, after the 20, uh, 2007 and 2008 financial crisis. And now if you, when you realize that the, the risks, that the problems are systemic, uh, it is because too few people have too much control, too much authority, too much money uh, that uh, we saw what happened and you know, a lot of it was actually paid out by the taxpayers. Actually like Iceland, they put all the bankers to jail. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, we're talking about a, a new era. So 
Here's what I want to talk about. Just to put it very simply, I covered the fact that there's demand for capital. Uh, most of the entrepreneurial activity actually comes from small, even cottage scale entrepreneurs in the US. And the fact there is supply for capital because, because the trends are changing. But an important element of that is technology. The fact that technology is actually leading this revolution. It is deciding the pace, I'm sorry, and it is deciding the direction of this revolution. So you want to be at the intersection of this Venn diagram. And so this is where the crowdfunding model um, comes in. So I actually did a report on this, what I call crowdfunding meets blockchain last year. And we are looking to build a trading platform for crowdfunded equity. Uh, the secondary market is actually non-existent in the United States. So if you buy securities or uh, whatever from a crowdfunding portal, you would be stuck with that equity for seven to 10 years on average. But the need for a secondary market has always been there and, and recognized by the regulators. Um, and you know, if you think about it, the secondary market is critical and it points towards the health of the primary markets. So I was looking at the literature and realized, hmm, there's actually nothing out there. Now what happens if you do it on blockchain? Um, you know, if the underlying network structure is not a centralized one, but a peer-to-peer -peer one, it changes things drastically. Um, the public markets are actually so liquid and the speed you have is so because there are people who sit on both sides of the market and there are central banks that pump liquidity into the markets. And guess what? The biggest trades are actually executed in dark pools, which are alternative trading systems. And so the, 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 mar the public markets you see, at least in the United States, is not the true picture of really what is moving around. So, uh, but if you use a blockchain backend, all of this would be transparent. So we had questions around, wait, wait a second, what would happen to the liquidity of such a market? Would there be enough buyers or sellers? And it's funny because I, I think it took me back to a more fundamental question as to how much liquidity is enough liquidity? Because the incentives of people who are trading on blockchain are probably different from people who are trading in uh, public markets, right? Which is really to uh, rent seeking, so on and so forth. So anyway, this report is out there for those who are interested in a talk about some of the literature from information asymmetries and how blockchain addresses tra uh, transaction and search costs and reduces them, and what happens uh, as far as the liquidity considerations and market design uh, of such a market is concerned. And I think I'm gonna ask John to take over from here. Thank you. This is a quality panel. Isn't this good? These guys are so smart. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, go over some of these points they've already made, but I'm gonna do it while I'm standing up because I get excited about this. So IPOs are broken. Initial public offerings do not work. <clears throat> and Kyle spoke really uh, eloquently about this. Favored customers, of the issuer and the underwriter get the initial shares. They get a sweetheart deal, and those shares are purposely underpriced so that they can then turn around and sell these once the shares go on the market. And who pays for that? The public pays for that. So when we call them initial public offerings, it's kind of true, but the public is actually paying for it. The 99% at the expense of the 1%. And the SEC actually encourages this behavior saying a firm may not sell you IPO shares unless it has determined the investment is suitable for you. This doesn't work. And a lot of folks say, well, we're protecting the investors. But we don't protect investors from going out and gambling away their life savings at the lottery or at the casino. In fact, the government will help you do that by calling it things like mega millions and lucky lotto. So I don't buy that argument. I think the IPO system is completely broken and unworkable. And the promise of ICOs is to open up capital to everybody, to the masses, to bring us to the promised land so that we can all participate in these new funding projects. All of us decentralized. And like a Kickstarter campaign, like a crowdfunding campaign, thousands of us can participate in these new blockchain ventures. And like an IPO, you can buy tokens that can be traded like shares. To be clear, they're not shares. You don't own equity in a company. But you can trade them on public exchanges in a similar way 
to shares. So that is the promise of ICOs, and that's how we started out maybe a year ago, but things moved quickly. The lawyers got involved, the SEC got involved and said, you know what, these things look a lot like securities. They look a lot like shares. And so now most of these are only open to accredited investors, which means kind of rich, have to be worth a million dollars or more. And that's a shame. I think that's a shame because this takes away the promise of ICOs, which was that we could all participate in them. The other problem that's happened is the ICO market has gotten so competitive that you actually have to raise a ton of money just to raise the money in the ICO. So we have this new thing called a pre-ICO or a pre-sale. And this is what these founders and entrepreneurs are now doing, is going on a long road show around the world to try to get early investors into these ICOs or to give them the money. These early investors are usually whales. They're people who bought Bitcoin back in 2013 or their family offices. They're people who understand the crypto space. And what they get out of it is they get a discount on the tokens. So they're buying them more cheaply so that they can then sell them when the ICO starts trading on public exchanges. That's exactly like an IPO. <laughs> That's exactly the same thing. That's a problem. That is a huge problem. Now, the one thing that gives me tremendous hope at this point is that there are a couple of new companies that are bringing back the crowd sale model. Check out Republic and check out Indiegogo. These two guys are both using what Nabrup mentioned, the Jobs Act, or Ed mentioned, about uh, legislation that allows us to raise up to a million dollars specifically for crowdfunding uh, initial uh, uh, funding of companies. And that gives me tremendous hope because I think we're getting back into the whole idea behind ICOs. We need to self-regulate. We need to regulate ourselves and act in a way that is going to help, help the government, help the government figure out how to regulate this. And some simple principles I suggest is number one, everybody should be able to participate at the same time. That's the spirit of the blockchain. That's the spirit of decentralization. As Navrup or Ed said, I'm sorry, one of you said, we need to develop full business plans. I am sick of white papers. A white paper is a technical specification. It's a technical doc. It does not tell you who the market is. It doesn't tell you how you're going to get people to adopt. It does not tell you any of that. I want the rigor that an entrepreneur would need to go to a VC firm. I want to tie payouts to milestones. If you raise a million bucks, you should get half of it up front. You should get half of it when you have reached certain milestones. And most importantly, I want transparency, honesty, and trust. That's what we're doing at Bitcoin Market Journal. We do not accept advertising on our website because we have seen this space as all pay to play. And we have said we're going to create a different kind of media company, one that is not reliant on advertising. Advertising is broken. It does not work, and especially does not work in this space. So we are going for transparency, honesty, and trust. So for you, all of you who are in this space, figure out how do we develop systems that reward transparency, honesty, and trust. Because that's the promise of initial coin offerings. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank all three of you for that. Yeah. When, when we're all done, I'm, I'm going to join John in the campaign to obliterate the word white paper for the <laughs> blockchain community. Thank you. Um, well, just based off, John, on what, uh, what you just mentioned about the sort of an ICO kind of turning into an IPO, but then it's trying to move back. When you have things like white papers, not business models, how do regular retail investors and institutional investors alike value an ICO? Uh, Navrup and I co-authored a paper uh, on valuing tokens, and we actually have a, a model that we create. So it's like a template or like a scorecard. And we really want this to become the, uh, the industry, uh, the, the rating kind of standard for everyone. And you basically have certain categories you fill out uh, for each one. And by doing that across each of these ICOs or these, these offerings, you have an apples to apples comparison that you can use. And that's what we do at Bitcoin Market Journal. We have analysts that actually use that. So using the same criteria to rate everyone. You want to say more about that, Navarup? Yeah, I want to say it's the first paper on behavioral economics applied to token valuation. We were asking this question, how is 
that people are putting real dollars behind tokens, which aren't even equities. They may look like equities, but you know, there's a disclaimer saying these are these are these are not securities. And so, it, you know, it took us to a more fundamental question as to how do humans, as economic agents, uh, perceive value and measure value. So this actually comes from the work of Daniel Kahneman and Emma Stravinsky, and we apply that to the Timmons model for entrepreneurship. So just fleshing that out a little. But you guys are welcome to have a look. It's it's public, and we've submitted it as a book chapter. And we, we have copies of that here. If you'd like one afterward, we have copies for free. Great. Uh, so just just a question from my pr perspective. How do you reconcile rating coins under the same system that have different structures? I mean, maybe one's a utility token, and obviously we all know that utility tokens can have different structures. Are you sort of incorporating that variety into your same model? How do you, I'm just wondering how you reconcile those. Sure, so we're not comparing whether it's a security versus a utility token. What we are really focusing on is the business. Uh, the Timmons model for entrepreneurship is what you use for evaluating any new startup. At the end of the day, raising capital is just one phase of your business. The real stuff happens after you raise the capital, right? And then you start to build the, the product or the service or the platform. So what we're really looking at is indicators such as what is the market for this? Uh, will it open up new industries? Uh, so on and so forth. So uh, at the end of the day, it is about the idea, the plan, and the platform. Okay, that's, that's helpful. Yeah, and, and I think you know, what, what you ought to all be hearing from us is you're building a business, right? That hasn't changed. You want a business plan, not a white paper, right? That, all of that hasn't changed. Right, I think part of the reason why the space has gotten so much negative uh, you know, uh, feedback is because a lot of companies are looking at it as a quicker way to raise a lot more money, and, and that is damaging to everyone else. You know, the promise of actually decentralizing capital formation, uh, opening up to the crowd, which is holding uh, liquid assets, it is being diluted by this. And, and as John pointed out, it's sort of like going back to, again, with uh, the way IPOs are done, where a few privileged parties, uh, you know, actually participate in the sale. Great. So Ed, just, just for you, you mentioned that, you know, a company could first look at venture capital funding, but maybe if that doesn't work out, then they can pursue an ICO because all of the routes are kind of exhausted. I'm wondering if, if there's any situation in which someone would prefer to do an ICO versus any kind of venture capital funding and what they need to sort of get right or what they need to consider when taking the steps to launch an ICO. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, and uh, don't, don't think I'm here trying to pitch VCs, right? I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's got a lot of disadvantages. You know, John, Kyle, we've ta you know, talked about that, but it is well understood, right? <laughs> right or wrong, uh, it's, a, it's a well understood process. Um, it has the limitations we've all talked about, but we all know what those limitations are. We know what the, you know, that, that there's that, that structure. Um, you know, again, when, you, when you're looking at that ICO approach, I think it's perfectly fine to say, forget that, that's never gonna be a good model for us. Or, I mean, you might just simply say, we do not want to perpetuate that model of doing business by getting involved with it at all, right? Good, bad, or otherwise, we are just, th that's, that's not the way the world is moving. We want to uh, help move the world forward. You know, I, th I think that's just, that's just really essential. I think, you know, honestly, I think I've got a problem with that because, uh, first of all, the criteria that VCs use, so how does, how does VC work, R right? They, they invest in 50 companies and only one of them needs to work at the end of the day. There's so much uncertainty in early stage companies that it is impossible to predict and account for all the factors that would come in, ultimately, you know, taking a company towards uh, an exit side of things. What John and I are actually proposing is that exact criteria, but in such a way that normal people, you and I actually understand it. It is not something that is hijacked by just a small community of people who, who make m quick money. And then at the same time, I think it's easier for entrepreneurs, that's the only um, good thing I can think about, raising VC uh, money, because you're only dealing with a few people. But at the same time, what about you know decentralization, democratization, all of that is just out of the window. Because uh, you know, VCs is, but, but you're me, really I've, concentrating I've done it a capital. Few times and I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm uh, not wi not interested in that pain again. But I think the key is, and the model you know that that you two talked about, 
I think is really key, right? It applies in, in you know, what, what, what you've shown is this applies in any world. This world is not different. And I think that's really key in terms of feeding into your, to your uh, token valuation and, and how you think about it. One of the things I've seen this a number of times with Kickstarter, a good model there are the, the Kickstarter, if you look at the, the largest Kickstarter campaigns, right, for Pebble, for the, or your game console, whatever, and you look down and you do the math, you realize that an enormous fraction, often two-thirds, three-quarters of the proceeds from your Kickstarter campaign go to pay to make the stuff that you promised the people that, you know, who, who engage in your campaign. So only a third of that is left over a quarter for you to actually do something else with. And again, that's a factor of sort of valuing what are the obligations you're taking on as part of that effort. And it all factors into the, to the same valuation model. It's, uh, the world is, is, other than the democratization, which is awesome, the, the business that you're in it doesn't, you know, is no different than it used to be. I'm, I'm meeting a lot more VCs who are trying to kind of create a hybrid model. So if you picture the VC coming in at this pre-ICO stage and helping get these companies off the ground, uh, and I think that the smart VCs see that there's this tidal wave of change coming. Their whole business is being completely disrupted. The dumb ones, of which there are many, are saying this is not really worth us bothering about. But the smart ones see we got to figure out a way to work with this whole system. And so there is a, some very interesting hybrid models coming out. They help you fund at the beginning. They give you the expertise. That is what a VC brings. They bring you the connections. There's lots of value that they bring. But then you can go do the ICO and do this more in a, in a democratized way. Yeah, and I, and I think, uh, you know, the Tezos uh, uh, ICO is a perfect example, right, where their, you know, their biggest buyer was Tim Draper, you know, one of the biggest well-known VCs of them all, right? And what's he doing? He's getting in there and, and buying, the, buying the tokens and, and supporting that into the world. I'd just like to mention that Cosmo Ventures is a hybrid model, so I don't take offense to perfect. that. Perfect, so. <laughs> perfect, yeah. Um, so, John, I just had a quick question for you. H how much does a typical ICO raise and how much pre-money private investing is typically needed to launch a successful IPO? Are they directly correlated? Are they somewhat correlated? Yeah, so we've uh, analyzed about 1,000 ICOs at Bitcoin Market Journal. The average raise is $12.5 million. $12.5 million. That's of the reported ICOs. So that's the first headline. Second headline is half of them go unreported. Half of them go unreported. So that means they're either not, <laughs> they're not raising anything or they're not being transparent about it. So of the ones that report $12.5 million, so the average Series A VC investment round is $5 million. So you can see from a founder's point of view, like how great it would be to say, I'm going to be raising two and a half times what I'm going to get from a VC. Also, I don't have to deal with VCs. And also, I own the whole company at the end of the day. I don't give up any equity. And that's why ICOs are so attractive at this point. But it is so expensive. So to your second question, it costs anywhere from half a million to $5 million just to launch the ICO. And the challenge is just getting heard above all the noise right now, because there's so many ICOs out there. Facebook, LinkedIn, everybody's cracking down on advertising. So getting the message out about your ICO is incredibly difficult and getting more difficult by the day. So yeah, just, and, a, uh, just, just, add, just as, at that last point, uh, about on a, a typical Kickstarter Indiegogo uh, site, about 60% of the revenue comes from your own network, right? You're sort of, you know, uh, going downstream from that. So just don't forget the fact that you've got to find somebody out there. Yeah, so first of all, I would not compare Kickstarter with ICOs and IPOs. Like I mentioned, it's a reward-based crowdfunding. Uh, Apples to Apple comparison would be equity-based crowdfunding. So different, uh, completely different, uh, you know, uh, incentives as a result of regulation there. The second thing I want to mention, John, just as a note of caution, like average 12 and 5, I saw a reaction there. And, and the problem is the market is extremely skewed. The ICOs that are raising money are actually raising a lot of money, and the ones that are not are raising no money whatsoever. If you average it together, just statistics, it's 12.5. That doesn't mean all of you should go out and do an ICO because you're going to make 12.5 at least. So just... Yeah, I'm sure the median is much lower than the mean for that reason, right? Um, so. Yeah, so he talked about mean and not the median. Yeah. Um, okay, great. So I think we're kind of coming up on time. I wonder if we should open it up to questions yeah. for yeah, the audience, if anyone has any questions here. back there. I think. Sure. So the problem is, it sounds like the IPO 
show about this program. We want to get more people interested. But if I could say, why is 90%, or excuse me, 90% of the IPO going for blockchain technology? Shouldn't it also be going for biotech, you know, advanced you know, artificial intelligence? I mean, why, why is the technology of blockchain tied to the IPO <laughs> process? So, yeah. the, so the question is, why is every ICO a blockchain project? if it's the future of fundraising? Yeah, it's a good question. Well, I mean, I would just like to say that, first of all, blockchain is not, it's a technology that can be implemented across various um, different fields, right? So we, I mean, we have a, um, a cybersecurity blockchain company that deals primarily in medical devices, right? So there's a various number of different fields that can like use an ICO. But right now, the reason why, okay, why can't any company just do an ICO that's not blockchain affiliated is that a lot of the time, especially under the current regulatory environment, you need almost a utility ICO as opposed to a security, right? The jury's still out on whether or not ICOs are a security, whether or not they're gonna allow utility tokens at all, um, or if they're gonna just categorize them as securities. And um, you know the SEC, whether it's going to fall under them or the CFTC, it's un it's undetermined. Yeah, let me let me take a step back yeah. here and see if I could uh, take a stab at that. Um, so, 2015, Ethereum was launched as the second public chain after Bitcoin, and they allow for what is called a ERC20 token, right? And they started doing. They actually did the first ICO. There were some before that, but the first major ICO. Let me just put it that way. In 2014, and and launched the um, uh, the, the public chain in 2015. Now, the entire ecosystem, this huge beast, is sort of like a self-feeding beast that started with Ethereum, and with 72 lines of code, you can launch a token. You can do a sale, and uh, there's a reason why they are all blockchain. Is this new promise, and it's actually part of the problem because that might be, uh, you know, the, the narrative of it being decentralized, and we just saw it's actually not that decentralized, uh, is what's being used, but it's not really happening, if that makes sense. And, and the blockchain is, oh, the IPOs are rigged, crowdfunding doesn't work, you can only raise a million dollars, that's nothing. For, for companies, for entrepreneurs, and then if you want to interact with the OTC markets or the counter, which is sort of more peer-to-peer, -peer, unless you have at least a million dollar worth of uh, moving between the markets, it's not worth the, uh, the, the fee that it, it causes. There is what is called a search cost, which is pretty high. Well, it started with that. Right, right. And, by, and by the way, if, if, if you, you don't want to type those 72 lines of code, you can just copy and paste them from Ethereum's <laughs> website, right? But, you know, I mean, I think you're right. It's a matter of explaining what it is you're doing. Again, I think that's what CryptoKitties is great no, about. No, I think his, his point doing. is really critical. Technology is the key, like I previously mentioned, because it is facilitating such a quick way of raising capital, which is impossible. And all three or four models that we described, whether it's IPOs, whether it's OTCs, whether crowdfunding, you have to register with a portal, you have to go through due diligence, you have to get lawyers in place, it's easily gonna cost close to a million dollars. And it's like, that's where you raise anyway, more than uh, in, in you know less than a year. So the reason why it is all blockchain is because it's so much easier with blockchain. And there's a platform out there, which we call a platform problem. So a large part of the market is right there. So if you don't do it on Ethereum, you would be locking out of a huge majority of investors. And so it's a self-feeding beast, like I mentioned. Here's a useful model. 1994 on the web. That's where we are. 1994, 1995. If you tried to create a website in 94, and I did, it was very hard. It was so technically complex. You guys at MIT could do it, but that was it. Yeah, it's really hard for people to do, because they're just, the technology wasn't there. Netscape came along and changed the game. Suddenly the web was accessible to everybody. CompuServe got everybody online on the internet, and suddenly the masses came in. That's where we are. We're at that critical threshold right now where the early majority gives way, sorry, the early adopters give way to the early majority. And we need technology. So for all of you, there's such opportunities, so much work that needs to be done to make this stuff user friendly, to make it easy to use, to make it accessible to everybody. That's why we're up here talking, to make this stuff accessible and explainable 
to everyone. Education, technology, getting people on board, helping your grandmother buy Ripple. All of this stuff matters. <laughs> really, it's really important, and that's what you all can take away from here and help us build this ecosystem, because it's awesome, it's so much fun. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And if you think back to the, the adoption curves that I mentioned earlier, we are under that 10% threshold so far. So I think once you get there, you are going to see a wider adoption of the ICO market. Any other questions we have? I mean, there are a bunch of channels, right? So social media is a big one. Really, crowdfunding is at the intersection of raising capital, uh, new ideas, and social media and social networks. So, and, and you know, it really is an evolution of that. So there's that. The traditional way is marketing. You just go and have, you know, build your client base, and you, there's a, a customer acquisition cost and all the traditional metrics you can talk about. Uh, but this thing is rapidly changing because we are increasingly connected. And there's what is called network externalities, uh, where any, every time you bring in one person, that person in turn is connected to 200 other people, so you can tap into their network as well. And that's really what ICOs are doing. So now we're realizing that it is so much easier to cascade through networks in through social media and, and other such platforms than spend millions and billions of dollars, really, big companies do on, on marketing. So. Yeah, and I think the word ICO doesn't change that. I mean, I, you know, you know, anything there is just get out on social, get out that network, you know, market your product. I saw a cool pro uh, project called doc.io. Has anybody seen this? It's like a LinkedIn, it's like a decentralized LinkedIn, and uh, somebody sent me an invite. I totally fell for this. And uh, they said you can earn cryptocurrency by inviting people to doc. And uh, it just imported my whole LinkedIn address book, which is very large, and I sent out this doc. Uh, welcome letter to everybody, and then I started earning these doc tokens for it. How much money did you make, John? I made fifty dollars. <laughs> really? Fifty dollars for whoring out my network. <laughs> and uh, I think I you did pretty well. <laughs> and I thought it's pretty great. I mean, the idea behind it, the idea of like, we've all got these networks already, and you can find an incentive for people to share that and earn cryptocurrency or earn some kind of value. Should they should? This is the problem with Facebook right now. Like, right, we get none of the value. Facebook gets all the value. We should be sharing in the value that we are creating for these platforms. That's the promise of this stuff. Yeah, that's a very critical point. Monetizing your own data, controlling it, and actually making use of it, and not a third party doing it. Okay, we're coming up on time. I think we have maybe time for one more question. question. Make it sure. good. <laughs> Ask when you can. Are you asking for the f for the venture capital firms that are doing for the pre-ICO? ICO or okay. So a lot of what people are doing, like John previously mentioned, are these road shows. But here's the thing. If it's a utility token and you don't want the SEC to come after you, what they're doing is they're building a network of users first. So a valuable user network, and they're airdropping these tokens through social media. So basically, they're not selling it to you, and it's not an investment. They're simply giving it to you. As you go and use these tokens on their network, the value of the network grows through what is called the Metcalf Law, which is uh, proportional, uh, the square of it, to the number of users. And then you can start monetizing it. So that's the newest that we've seen in the space. I'll say two words. Add value, add value. It is so easy to create value in this space right now. We're creating value up here right now. You guys take this, these ideas and go run with these and start your own. How much value are we creating today in this panel? Like, uh, yeah, priceless, right? Priceless. <laughs> oh, I like that. Right, like a billion, a trillion. I, it's Clearly like, more than 50 bucks. No, <laughs> more than 50 bucks, yeah. <laughs> So figure out ways to add value with your project, with your blockchain project, with your ICO, and the more you do that, the more the good stuff will come back to you naturally. It's just the way the world works. 
Great. One so last question, Bill. Okay, we can oh, do one yeah. more. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I mean, th the reason why Jobs Act clarified all of this, unless you're making 100,000 at least a year, you cannot invest more than 2,000 for one year in one year's time in a crowdfunding portal. And that's really nothing, right? If, you, if you're making more money, then you can spend up to 5,000. So that's one of the mandates of the SEC along with efficient markets. And, and you know, they're doing it. Uh, the thing is, I think people want to take risk. There is a, <laughs> there is a I, I remember a conference I attended in London and there was a lady from China and she said, Chinese grandmas have a lot of money. If people want to be stupid, let them be stupid. It's not your problem. And, and it's funny because I went bo uh, back home and I thought, my God, I'm going to write a paper on the changing risk preferences of investors in the current day with the new asset classes that are, that are available now that weren't available 10 years ago. So I think a more systematic study is required in this and, and people want to take risks. I incomes are increasing, but it's harder and harder to invest money. I want to invest money. I'm not earning anything from putting money in the bank account. They are earning a lot of money. And what's happening with that money is they're putting a lot of money in very concentrated markets and when a crash happens, it ultimately comes down to us pay as a taxpayers. And, and by the way, the world is a lot bigger than the United States. So whatever you're doing, just <laughs> don't think about just the U.S. Yeah, I like that. How, how do you help investors understand is educate, educate, education. We have this uh, blockchain innovation park, Genesis Plaza, One Beacon Street. You're all welcome to stop by. It's a beautiful space up on the 15th floor on the Freedom Trip. And uh, we have about a dozen blockchain companies and entrepreneurs who are all there kind of innovate. We do a... Uh, blockchain lunch and learn meetup, which is open to the public. We don't make any money from this. We, in fact, pay a lot for people to come in and to learn. And the idea is, like, we're just helping people learn and get into the space and understand and hopefully make smart, informed investment decisions so they don't spend their kid's college fund on Bitcoin, but they think about it as a small allocation of the portfolio. But at the same time, they do invest. They do get into it a little bit, even if it's only 50 or 100 bucks, because that will help this ecosystem grow. So education, education, education. I, I think that's exactly right. And I, we're, we're just about out of time, so I'd like to thank my, my panelists here and thank all of you for coming and ideas for, for hosting this. I think we're going to be um, around if you want to ask us some questions in the lobby. But, but thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank you.